text for the sermon this morning comes to us from the Gospel of John, the 10th chapter, verses 7 through 10. So Jesus again said to his disciples, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. In this text, Jesus promises to his disciples, to the people that are gathered around listening to him, that he has come to give life in abundance to his sheep. The thief, Jesus says, will only steal and kill and destroy, but Jesus has come that they would have life and have it abundantly. So what is an abundant life? But if you went around and uh, knocked on doors this afternoon and asked your neighbors, what does an abundant life look like? You'd probably get a variety of answers, but everybody's really humming the same tune, right? And abundance means lots of something. It means to have a surplus. So if you're asking your friends and neighbors, what does that look like in life? They're going to tell you things like, well, it looks like an abundance of money in my pocket, or maybe an abundance of money in my retirement fund. Maybe it looks like an abundance of space in my house, or an abundance of homes, an abundance of toys, either little boy toys or big boy toys. It looks like an abundance of free time to do whatever I wish. And this is the American dream, right? To have the freedom to go after an abundance of the things that I want. But that is not an abundant life. It certainly isn't the kind of abundant life that Jesus is talking about. These things, in fact, are clearly our idols. They're false gods, false gods that we typically want more of. But these are the things that Jesus says will steal and kill and destroy. They are the thieves. And we see that more clearly when we hear what Jesus is actually saying in the text. Jesus does not say that he has come to give you an abundance of stuff. The quote is not, I have come that they may have things and things in abundance. Jesus has come that they may have life and life in abundance. He promises to give you life, lots of life, a surplus of life. You see, if you go back to those thieves, right, all of those other things that, that people think that they want and will give them an abundance of life, if you make any one of them your goal in life, if you think, if I just have more money, or more time off, or if I could just retire early, or if I could just have a certain number of children, or a certain number of acres to farm, or if I could find that one perfect wife or husband who will complete my life, you will never, never have enough. How much money is enough for somebody who thinks that money will make their life abundant? Always just one dollar more. Just look around at the wealthiest people in the world, the people whose wealth makes you stagger. What are they still doing? They're still working. They could retire and spend a million dollars a day until they died and have lots left over, and they're still working because it's never enough. And it never will be. 
Jesus has come to give us something completely different not an abundance of things that we could attain on our own, but something that we certainly cannot. He has come to give us life. So what does that look like? What does it look like for Jesus to give you life? Well, in other places in John's gospel, Jesus says things like, I am the way and the truth and the life. He says, I am the resurrection and the Life. He says, I am the bread of life. So if Jesus is going to give you life, he is going to do it in no other way than to give you an abundance of himself. And that's what he does. Everything that Jesus does in his ministry, everything from his conception in his mother's womb on through his ascension into heaven and beyond is giving himself to you. Every word that he speaks, every parable that he tells, every miracle he performs, every time he cures the sick or feeds the hungry or gives sight to the blind, Jesus is giving himself to the people. And this happens very dramatically on Good Friday. It happens at the cross where Jesus is literally sacrificing himself to the Father for you. He is giving up his life for you. But it doesn't stop there. It's not as if Jesus says, well, you've got enough of me, so I'm going to move on. He keeps going. He gives himself in his resurrection. He gives himself in his ascension, and he continues to give himself, just as Mr. Barth said in the children's message this morning, He gives himself through his word, continually. Every time we sing a hymn, we pray the Lord's Prayer, we read the scriptures, we have a devotion, every single time, Jesus is giving himself to you. He does it in the waters of baptism. St. Paul says in Romans 6 that in baptism, you die and rise with Christ. It's as if God himself reaches down and grabs a hold of you and binds you to Jesus so that whatever is his is yours. So his life and his resurrection, all those good things now belong to you. And all of your bad things, your sin and death and temptation, all of those things belong to him. He gives himself to you. And he does it no place for us here today in the church more dramatically than when we partake of the Lord's Supper. Jesus passes out bread and wine and he says, this is my body. This is my blood. He is taking his life and putting it in your mouth so that your life will continue so that his life would be yours and you would have life in abundance. And so it is that on the last day when Jesus returns, your life or you will be so filled with the life of Christ that your dead body will rise. And if you're not dead, your body will be changed in the twinkling of an eye, St. Paul says. You will have eternal life. That is an abundant life. And what this does is it it changes things, right? It changes things for us. Uh, And St. Paul lays this out for us very nicely in Philippians chapter 3. Listen to what Paul says. Whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. 
that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Now, St. Paul had a pretty abundant life before he met Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus. It was, it was full of things that you and I probably wouldn't care much about, but to Paul and the people of his day, these were important things. Things like being descended from the right tribe. He was an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham. Better than that, he was from the tribe of Benjamin, one of the biggest, most powerful, most famous tribes in the Old Testament. He was a Pharisee, which meant he was better than everybody else. And he wasn't afraid to tell them that. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews. He was blameless under the law. All of these were things that filled his life with pride and boasting. And all of them, Paul says, are in comparison with Christ, rubbish. Which is a very polite British way of saying garbage. They're trash compared to knowing Christ. All of those things that we thought we wanted before Christ, the money and the vacation time and the homes and the children and the land and the animals and all of those things that can be good gifts from God, that we tend to want to worship instead, all of them in comparison with Christ are garbage. And when we have had Christ, when he gives himself to us, they are all put in their proper place. And they take on even more significance than they had before because they are no longer our masters, they are our gifts from God himself. And again, this changes everything, right? Having this abundance of Christ in ourselves, this abundance of Christ fed to us through his word and his sacraments continually that changes the way we look at the world. To give you just one little example, it changes the way we look at time. You see, our typical attitude toward time is that time is the one thing they're not making any more of. And if time goes away, if I lose time, then it's gone. I'm never going to get that time back. So if there's someone who needs my help and I run into that person and I give them the five seconds or five minutes or five hours or five decades that it might take to really help this person, to really give them the care and the aid that they need, that's time that I will never get back. And God looks at that situation, and he says, okay, I can fix that. Boom. Now you'll live forever. Now you will literally never run out of time. So if you are a mother who spends 20 years raising her children, that is not time that is lost. If you are a son who spends 30 years caring for his aging parents and doing chores around their home and making sure that they're taken care of, that time is not lost. You see, if you miss out on something here in this world and it is good, it will be waiting for you in the world that is yet to come. And if you miss out on something here in this world and it's not good, it won't be waiting for you and you probably shouldn't worry about missing out on it in the first place. See, the problem is solved. You truly have all the time in the world. And you are now freed by Christ to spend that time in loving service to the people that God puts in front of you to your friends, to your family, to your neighbors, even to your enemies. And that time is not wasted. It is not lost. It is yours in abundance. And so it is my prayer that each and every one of you may be so filled with the abundance of Christ 
and the abundance of his life that you receive life everlasting, a truly abundant life. In Jesus' name, amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. You have been sharing in the Sunday morning worship at Zion Lutheran Church, 205 Pulaski Street in Lincoln, Illinois where you have just heard Pastor Joshua Tylan deliver the message for this morning. Zion conducts worship services at 8 and 10.30 a.m. on Sunday mornings. Sunday School for All Ages is at 9.20 in our education building. We invite you to join us in person for this worship, fellowship, and Bible study. If you cannot be physically present, please join us every Sunday morning at 8 o'clock over WLLM 1370 a.m., or WLLM 90.1 FM, or translators at Lincoln and Springfield at 105.3 FM on your radio, or on cable channel 5, or the LCTV app on your smartphone on weekends at 10 a.m. and 5 p.m., and weekdays at 8 a.m. and 5 p.m. Zion's worship services are also available live via the internet at www.zlclinc.org. Zion is a member congregation of the Worldwide Fellowship of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. If you're without a church home, we invite you to become a part of the Zion family. If we may assist you in any way, please call us at 732-3946 or write to us at Zion Lutheran Church, 205 Pulaski Street, Lincoln, Illinois, 62656. Zion also offers a premier education with a Christian worldview for children from age 3 through the 8th grade at Zion Lutheran School. If you would like more information concerning our school, please contact the school office at 732-3977. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.